Uh, welcome to the 19th common session of Sonoikis Digital Classics 2017. Today, our guests, our guests, I have to say, are from Croatia, from the University of Zagreb. We have Professor Neven Jovanovic and his uh, collaborators, and they are going to talk about reading and annotating the Greek text of Aristophanes' words and the Latin text of all its metamorphoses using um, the Recogito uh, platform. Uh, Professor uh, Jovanovic has been collaborating uh, with us us since the beginning in, uh, of uh, Sunoikesis, and uh, I have to thank him because really he always uh, contributes a lot and uh, he's helping us since the beginning. But now I think we can start. So, Neven, welcome. Thank you for your contribution to Sunoikesis, and of course, welcome to your um, group of uh, contributors today. So I think you can start uh, in, you have to unmute yourself because I can't unmute you. Okay, so welcome Monica. I hope you can hear us. Yes. Uh, thank, yeah, uh, thank you for being here. Thank you for inviting us to Sinoikisis. Now uh, here in Zagreb, it is, uh, it is summer already and it is our last week of lectures uh, so we are almost done and for for my colleagues here this will be uh, something like a final exam but i won't be very strict here uh, so we are we are here together today to explain to everybody uh, what we did over the semester we have been uh, of course we have been watching other presentations in the synoikesis and we have been discussing them and people had to write reports about them but we had also a project of our own and for this i've been lucky enough to have a, a whole group of uh, talented students which you will now be able to see some yeah. of them I, I think there are some yeah we can't the only thing is that we can't see you uh you can ah you cannot see no, us we can't see you at, at all oh sorry no just, wait, just wait a minute uh near near camera oh i can't so do it anymore so then just a moment uh, okay can you can you see something now no i just see your picture from google uh-huh. What is what is happening? Maybe try to switch on and on. Uh, yeah, yeah, just, just a moment. I think you know. Uh, okay. Uh, no. No. Hmm. Just a moment. We we can we can see us, but we cannot see oh we cannot see you uh, just let, just let me see what what i'll do just a moment no problem take your time these things happen. yeah because it's so no problem at all yeah. we can you can see them on on youtube though so maybe that's okay, ah, okay. In the hangout, but we can't okay mm -hmm. no problem so in youtube it works uh, so okay and um, yeah what is, what is happening can you can you explain uh, we can see you through YouTube, but we can't see you through the Google Hangout. Uh -huh. I don't know. So Sometimes it happens. This is not the first time. Uh -huh. So YouTube is recording this, actually. Yes, and uh, we can see you. <laughs> okay, then. <laughs> then thank you. You will, you will have to, Monica, you will have to look at the video later. <laughs> Yeah, no, no, but I, I can see you via YouTube, so no yeah. problem at all. The important thing is that we can see you your slides. So in YouTube, you are there. I can see the group. I can see. Okay, when oh, when we will five, be showing... five. <laughs> Okay, yeah. when we will be showing the slides, we will also check whether you can all see the yes. slides and so on. Okay, uh, uh, so here <laughs> here is the group. And we will start by introducing ourselves. So, as Monica has said, my name is Neven Jovanovic. I teach Latin and Greek at the University of uh, Zagreb. And here are the students of their fourth year. Some of them are fourth year in Latin. Some of them are fourth year in Greek. But they are all undergraduates uh, still. 
Uh, so they will introduce themselves now. Hello everyone, I'm Petar and I'm studying Hungarian and Latin language. Hi, my name is Mirna, I'm studying the Latin language and Judaic studies. Uh, hello, my name is Barbara and I'm studying classical philology. Hello, I'm Matea and I'm studying classical philology. Hi, I'm Florina and I'm studying pedagogy and Latin language. And hello, I'm Veronica and I'm studying classical philology. Hello, I'm Sandra and I study Latin and German language. Okay, so uh, this this is the theme. Uh, this is the theme that we'll be presenting to you today, uh, what we did over the semester. We had a small project uh, which included annotating two texts, one in Latin and one in Greek. Uh, but first, I will, I will now, yeah? I will, I will now give the, uh, now uh, Peter will introduce you to the text. Oh, but, but sh let, me, let me show you the slides first. So now I'm turning over to slides. If everything goes well, of course. Can you see the slides? Yeah. No, I can't. No. Uh, so let's see if, okay, other people, so the problem is, is my problem. Yes, it works, sorry. Yeah. Now it's working. Uh, yeah, so you should, you should see the initial slide now, hopefully. And uh, as I was saying, uh, this is what we will do today. We have already introduced the team, and now uh, Peter will tell you something about the text that we have, the text that we have been working on. So, Peter, please. Thank you. And show me when when I have to change the slides. Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. Again, I'm going to talk about uh, two famous uh, texts of ancient times. Our first text, uh, "The Birds," is a play by Aristophanes. Uh, he was an ancient Greek comic playwright who lived in the uh, 5th and 4th century BC. His plays are full of criticism of Athenian politics. The birds were performed for the first time in 414 before Christ at the festival of city Dionysia. The play won second prize. Uh, the main character here is Pisteteros, a citizen of Athens who persuades the chorus of the birds to build a new city in the sky. The city then gains control uh, over communications between humans and gods, and at the end even the gods uh, have to submit to the power of the new ideal city. This comedy was written and performed during the Sicilian expedition, a uh, daring Athenian move against the powerful Greek cities in Sicily. Uh, this episode of uh, Peloponnesian War will end in a catastrophic defeat of the Athenians. And our second text was the first book of Ovid's Metamorphosis. Publius Ovidius Naso was one of the most uh, famous Roman poets who lived in the time of Emperor Augustus. Metam Metamorphosis and Libri or Metamorphosis are one of his uh, greatest works. This epic poem is divided in 15 books. It has uh, 12,000 uh, uh, hexameters uh, and uh, approximately 250 uh, uh, different stories. Metamorphoses are about uh, changes. In every story there is a change of shape. It does not matter whether the characters who change are humans, gods, or whole world it's, uh, itself. Each of them uh, changes their form and appearance to become something else. Uh, the work opens with the transformation of the world uh, from the total chaos into something which has its own form, looks, and looks, at, let's say, very nice and is capable to be inhabited uh, by humans and other living species. The first book of the Metamorphosis tells us that, then, uh, that there were four different ages in the history of the world, uh, ages of gold, silver, bronze, and iron. Those ages were reflect changes in human nature. People become worse and worse, and from almost divine creatures to killers and cl criminals, conquerors and warriors. Then Ovid goes uh, on to tell his most famous stories about Jason and, uh, and Medea, Piamus and Thisbe, Daedalus and Icarus and others. 
Metamorphosis strongly influenced Western literature and, literature and civilization, and not only uh, painting and sculpture, but Shakespeare, Boccaccio, Dante, and, for example, Croatian Renaissance writers such as Marko Marović and Petar Hektorović. Okay, well, thank you, Peter. Uh, now let me, uh, I, will, I will call uh, Sandro here, just, just a moment, let me turn the screen share off for a moment. Sandro, can you, can you come here? <laughs> oh, you will come by a different way. <laughs> okay. Hello everyone. I hope you can hear me. And we can start the uh, screen share. Okay, now. so now we'll now we go on to the second part. Just a moment. Okay. So you will, you will be talking about the purpose of this experiment. Yes. Hello everyone, one more time. I'm Sandro and after Peter's introduction to the text we used as a research material, it would be quite useful to explain the purpose of our experiment and to give you some guidelines for an easier understanding of our presentation. First of all, I would like to uh, show you how to work in a special program called Recogito that is available on the internet. As you will see, oh, sorry, sorry. As you will see, we try to mark all the names that appear in the given text. At the beginning, that seemed to be easier than it really is. Step by step, name by name, we had to face up to the issues that were hidden behind all those names. As experienced linguists do, we had to find a way to organize all the results and to put them into sets. I can tell you that this was hard and satisfying at the, at the same time. You will hear more about these problems and the way we solve them from my colleagues Mirna, Barbara, Florina and Matea. And finally, since we are a part of academic community, we would also like to help and encourage our colleagues, other linguists, to use our research results as a base for potential research in this field. And now, please listen to my colleague Veronica, she will show you the main functions of this program Recogito by using the option screen share. <laughs> okay, uh, Veronica, can you can you come here now? Just a moment. Okay. Okay. Uh, hi, I'm Veronica, and I will tell you something more about annotating and how to do it. So okay. Can we can we turn the screen share on? Okay. okay. Just a moment. So we start from the slide. Yes. Okay. And now we have to switch to Recogito. Ah, we will switch to Recogito immediately. Just a moment. Oh uh, no, we we need your yours. Uh, this is this is yours. Okay. Yes. So you, you use the my the mouse and show us. What so uh, before we came here, uh, you have to create an account or login if you already have one. And the uh, first thing we have to do is to upload a new text document, and which I did. Here is the uh, last part of the first book of Metamorphosis by Ovid. And uh, on this text I will show you how to annotate. So uh, to annotate you have to select a text you want to annotate by clicking and dragging with your mouse or double clicking the word. So now we are, we are going to select word uh, pan here and now we can see this uh, cloud that has three options how we want to annotate it place person or event and uh, pan is a god uh, of uh, wild of shepherds so and pleasure and everything and is associated with nymphs so he is a person and we can click person uh, we also have uh, possibility to add a comment or a tag so we can write something which we, <laughs> which we didn't want to do now <laughs> yes okay. which we want to do now and you can also add a tag for example god we can write and click enter and now we have a tag 
And if you want to confirm it, we click OK. Uh, and Recogito also has uh, shows us this possibility to reapply uh, this uh, tag to every uh, word pun uh, in this part of the text. So if we want to, we can click yes or no. Not no. Uh, also in this verse, which goes redemuntem kola likario, panvi det hang prinukve kaput prekinktus akukta. We have also word likario. It is a mountain in Arcadia, so it is a place. And as you can see, uh, we can find it on a map, usually. Uh, Recogito finds it is itself uh, by using automatic uh, annotation, but now he didn't find anything. We can also search for it, but we won't do that now. And so we just confirm this place. Um, so this is just basic information about annotating. Uh, you can also uh, do much more with Recogito. And you can see that in our link. Uh, so you can also annotate uh, images. You can export your data to different formats. You can invite other users. Uh, and you can choose between different levels of access. It can be just read, write, or admin even. So uh, you have these op op options here, as you can see. Uh, but uh, you can uh, do all that by yourself later using tutorial. Mm -hmm. So uh, this is just uh, some basic information. And uh, now... So Veronica, excuse me just a moment. Uh, so this is actually what we did. We were yes. all annotating the same text. We were doing this yes. all together. We were doing um, it on Ovid and... Uh, yeah, we, we, were, we were sharing two texts and everybody had the possibility to look at the text and yes. to see what the other people have done and to discuss this. And we didn't use the comment field much, but what was important for us was to use the tags yes. and we will have the chance to, had, think, uh, to speak uh, on the tags. A lot to think about tags and the context of the words that we annotated and more about the context will tell you my colleague Irina. Later, yes, but we we also uh, we also forgot Veronica. We forgot to show the one uh, the one slide that you have. Yes. <laughs> Just a moment. Uh, so this <laughs> this is Veronica's slide, which tells you oh, where you can where you can find the tutorial. Uh, okay, uh, now we go to uh, Mirna. Yes, just a moment. Uh, while, while I uh, turn this back on to the window. Okay. So, Mirna, please. Hi, can you turn the presentation on? Oh, yes, but first, just <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted people to see that you are ready to give the presentation. Okay, now I will, I will, I will turn the screen share on again. Just a moment. Okay, here we are. You can change uh, uh, thank the you, slides. Veronica. Oh, <laughs> uh, now I will be saying a few words uh, regarding the importance of a context. Uh, I would like to point out certain things that we must be careful with when we annotate these kinds of texts. Um, in order to annotate them properly, we must look at certain words um, um, in relation to the sentence, the passage, or the complete text. Uh, for example, when we see the word Apollo, uh, uh, we can't right away annotate it as a de de deity, uh, because when you have that word in a sentence uh, like Maton Apollo, it is a different story, which my colleague Matea will explain in more detail later. We must also be careful with names that can mean two different things, for example, terra uh, or foibus, uh, but more on that problematic will be discussed later by my colleague Barbara. Um, another situation is the one that calls for preciseness, uh, for which the context is also needed. 
uh, it is when uh, there are names that can refer to more people, but in a certain context, they mean uh, they refer to one person. Uh, we have two examples of that in one uh, verse in Metamorphosis, in verse 390 of the first book, uh, which goes like, Inde promet hides plakidis e primet hidadictis mulket, uh, or then Prometheus' son comfort comforted Epimetheus' daughter with quiet words. So if we have, uh, for example, Prometheus, i.e. the offspring of Prometheus, who are Deucalion and Idos, if this name, Prometheus, refers to only one of them, we should comment on it uh, when we annotate that proper name in order to be precise. Uh, in this passage, Prometheus was a reference to Deucalion, as this passage re uh, revolved around Deucalion and Thera. And Epimethida, which means the offspring of Ep Epimetheus, uh, who are uh, Thera, Epira, and Prophasis, were, uh, here clearly refers to Thera. Uh, the last thing I have to address regarding the context is the option in the Recogito, Recogito program which allows us, uh, when we annotate a certain person or a place, to uh, automatically annotate the same word uh, throughout the whole text. Uh, we can see now that although it isn't wrong to do that, we have to check the context of uh, automatically annotated names to see if they aren't inaccurate. Uh, that was it for me regarding uh, this topic. Uh, now my colleague Barbara will um, take over with her part of the presentation regarding problems we are we were facing with nouns and adjectives. Okay, well, thank you, thank you, Mirna. I'll just adjust a moment while uh, while Barbara is coming up. Are you <laughs> are you sitting comfortable <laughs> here? Yeah. Okay. So please. Uh, so, uh, if we can move slides. Okay, just a moment. I, I, I will do the screen share and you give orders. Uh, okay, so, uh, as we already said, in our experiment, we were annotating names of people and places. Uh, first of all, we must define a name. Uh, by names, we considered words beginning with capital letter, no matter where they occur within a sentence. So, an example of a name uh, would be in Latin, focus uh, for a place, or in Greek, elpides for a person. But in Aristophanes, we read ten uh, erit hran et halatan, written in small letters, which means the Red Sea. So this clearly refers to a specific place that can be shown on a map, but it is not written in the capital letters. So we decided not to annotate it. So although we are aware that the Red Sea is a place just as focus, we had to pull the line somewhere and we left this for some other experiment. Uh, those were all examples of proper nouns, but in Greek and Latin, some adjectives are written in capital letters too. Uh, for example, uh, in Aristophanes, we have Olympios, uh, which means Olympian. Uh, adjectives derived from a name of place were especially interesting to us because in Croatian we don't write them with a capital letter. In other words, in Croatian there are no proper adjectives uh, derived from a name of place. However, we decided to annotate those as places because they are semantically connected to a place and in Greek and Latin they are names. Uh, the adjective Olympios was also interesting to us in its other form to Olympiu, uh, where cross is occurred, so it is not written in capital letter anymore, although it would normally be written to Olympiu with, with capital O. Uh, situations like this show us how important the human component is in annotating names, because if we theoretically had a computer program doing this for us, uh, it wouldn't have recognized to, to Olympiu as a name. Uh, uh, so, another category would be epithets, uh, characterizing words or phrases firmly associated with a person or thing, like for example, in Ovid it was Tonans, written with capital T. 
uh, tonans stands for Jupiter tonans, meaning thundering Joe, but in this place in the text the word Jupiter is omitted. Given that it is well known that tonans is paired with Jupiter, we, an, we are uh, annotated this as a name, and this is why those options that Veronica mentioned earlier were very useful. Uh, you can simply add a comment or a tag saying that tonans refers to Jupiter. Uh, so, uh, Mm -hmm. uh, so now that it's clear, uh, what do we mean by name? We can continue annotating people and places. Uh, for example, in Aristophanes, uh, we have Sophocles, and we know that is definitely a person of 5th century BC tragedian. Uh, as for a place in Ovid, we have, for example, the word Parnassus, which is a mountain located in central Greece. Okay. So those were uh, both uh, examples where it's clear whether it is a person or place. Uh, but let's look at the lines 157 and 58 in Metamorphosis. So now I should... Uh, no, no, not yet. Uh, not so, yet. Not yet. yet. Uh, so the line goes like this. Perfusam uh, muto natorum sanguine teram. In maduisse ferunt calidum quanimasse cruorem. Uh, and the translation would sound some, something, something like this. Uh, they say the earth was drenched with blood of her children and gave life to warm blood. So uh, here the author says the earth, which is a place, uh, was drenched with the blood of her sons as if it is a person. Uh, Ovid gives the earth human characteristics, so technically it would fit both in category of people and places. So what do we do here? Do we annotate the earth as a place or as a person? So let's now look quickly in the cogiton. Okay, just a moment. This is my part. Okay, thank yeah. you. Uh, so luckily, uh, the cogito allows us to annotate the same word both as a person and as a place. Uh, so here it is, Terra. Uh, we click on Terra and we annotate it first as place and then as a person. And as you can see, uh, it is now marked as a boat. Uh, and another question that we can ask ourselves when we have this situation is uh, if we want to annotate Terra on the ma ma map, if we want to mark it, where would we annotate it? But more about that problem, the problem of real and fictional characters and uh, places, you will hear from my colleagues, Matea and Florina. Okay, well, uh, thank you, Barbara. Uh, just a moment now while we, uh, while we change speakers. Uh, okay. Okay, thank you, Barbara. Now I'm going to tell you something about next step of annotating persons and places. We separated them into two categories. Let me go yes. off no, yes. to slides. Yes, you, yes. you have to tell me this. Okay. Okay. So now we are thinking about annotating persons and places. So first of all, we separated them, person and places, into categories: real or fictional, and human or divine. So let's move on with examples. As examples, there are few for each category. First example in Greek language. Gar katophagastis alos eklonimos, which we translated into English, is there another Latin besides Cleonimus? So here we have Cleonimus, he is a human and real person, often ridiculed by Aristophanes, but in this context he is described as Latin and coward. Please, next slide. Next examples present divine and fictional characters in Greek, O Heracles to T, Tipotesti dot Herion, or in English, by Heracles, what a creature, or another example, Matona Polo Gomenu, by Phoebus No. Here we have Heracles and Apollo, who are gods, but as Mina said, we have different case here because they are not mentioned as divines, but as a part of an exclamation. And please, next slide. And last two examples present real places. 
in sentence epikehodos eloge fasianikos, or in English, I am a cripple from the land of the pheasants. The uh, word fasianikos is an adjective and also a name or real place in coaches. In this example, is mentioned as name for bird pheasant. And final sentence in Greek. Or in English, by Zeus, I could not look at lepra without disgust because of melanthius. So here we have word ton lepra, which presents a real place service in today's Greece. But in this example, is mentioned in comical context because Melanthius was infected by skin disease like leprosy. So we have here some kind of funny etymology between these words, Tone Lepron and Melanthio. And it will be all from me. Now we'll continue my colleague Florida. Okay. Florina, please. Thank you. Hi, I'm Florina. Please move into slides. <laughs> okay, so I turn it over immediately. Just a moment. Uh, okay, uh, so I'm going to talk about uh, annotating uh, places uh, and persons, uh, but in Novit. Or you can do it yourself. Okay. Uh, so first about characters, we also divided them into fictional and real characters. Uh, most of the characters, uh, as Peter said, uh, there are many stories that appear in Ovid's first book, so many characters appear, but most of them are fictional and divine. Some, uh, for example, Jupiter and all the others. Winds also appear as uh, fictional and divine characters because, um, because winds are children of the titan Asterius and the uh, goddess no, I'm so Sorry, hello. Do we have some problems? No, <laughs> I hope not. Just a moment. Uh, can you, can you, can you just, just make a break? Just let me check whether uh, uh, excuse me, guys. Uh, we just heard some strange noise. Is everything all right? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we go. We go on. Um, so, uh, Florina, you was, you've been speaking about divine uh, about fictional divine characters, but there are also divine uh, fictional human characters. Yeah. yeah there was. Uh one of the few uh, fictional but human characters, it was like Keon, and he was mentioned in uh, the first book uh, as a person, uh, as a human who, uh, like all the other humans in the last, uh, in the Iron Age, uh, weren't, wasn't respecting the gods, so Jupiter was mad and turned him into a wolf. Uh, so, uh, Augustus, the first Roman emperor, uh, was the only real character in the first of its book and uh, he was mentioned in the context of sad times and events after Julius Caesar was murdered. Uh, next I'm going to be talking about Estria uh, and I'm going to read some verses in Latin. Victaia cat pietas et virgo caide madentis ultima caile stum terras astraia reliquit. Beauty was dead, and Virgin Estria, last of all the immortals, abandoned the blood-drenched earth. So, we know Estria as a goddess of innocence and purity, but here, in this passage, Ovid mentions her as a personification of just judgment. So, it reminds us that we always have to uh, see the context and understand it. So, the word Estria would be kind of tricky to annotate uh, as one thing. Next. Mm -hmm. And uh, another thing, places, we also divided them into fictional and real places. 
uh, even though there aren't many places in the first book, some of them are interesting enough to comment and to think about. For example, the mountain Olympus. Uh, I put it here as a fictional place, but and we know it's a, a real mountain in today's Greece, but uh, Ovid mentions this mountain as a home of gods in the tale of um, giants, where uh, when giants wanted to take down Jupiter, but Jupiter uh, hurled his bolt of lightning uh, and fractured the mountain Olympus. So we can see it's not really easy to um, decide whether if we, whether we uh, annotate it as a fictional or real place. Examples of real places would be the mountains Pelion and Osso. They were, uh, uh, they, were, they were actually mentioned in the same paragraph with the mountain Olympus, but they weren't referring as a home of God or anything uh, that is connected with gods, just as the mountains uh, nearby the mountain Olympus. So I uh, annotate them as the real place, real places. Uh, the Tartarus would be no. The Tartarus would be another uh, example of fictional place. Uh, this is the place where the sinners went. And in the next slide, I'm going to read some verses about chaos. Ante mare teras et quotegit omnia caelum unus erato to natura i vultus in orbe quem dixere chaos rudisinti gesta quemoles nec qui quam nisi pondus iners con gesta queodem, non bene iunctarum discordia seminarerum. Before there was earth or sea or the sky that covers everything, nature appeared the same throughout the whole world, what we call chaos, a raw, confused mass, nothing but inert matter, badly combined discordant atoms of things, confused in the one place.
that or if you have other more serious comments about the slides and uh, the annotations. Any comments from our participants? We have many people today in the Hangout, so... Okay, good, you can hear me. Can you also understand what I say? <laughs> Yes, of course, Stelios, please. So, uh, hi, all. Uh, you can hear me? Yes, yes, okay. we can. Uh, I found pretty interesting uh, that uh, the group to, chose to annotate Terra as a place and as a person simultaneously. Uh, and um, uh, I, what I would like to, to think more about is the purpose of such an annotation. Uh, what we gain, what we lose, if we lose anything, uh, adding this information, uh, especially because I think that if we do that without having a very clear idea what we consider to be a person and a place, a geographical unit, at the same time, then uh, we, we produce a rather confused picture, especially since in ancient Greece and Rome, many geographical entities was considered to be gods or some supernatural persons that could also act as such. That was my, my, my remark actually, not, not a real question, but with a part of question. Uh, Stelios, thank you. No, I, 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 definitely, I definitely agree. I think we, we can definitely agree on that, and this is a part of the difficulties of uh, annotations. Not only understanding the text, but then we, when we get results, also when we disambiguate these things, so we can get something confusing, definitely. But this is a, a good and a very interesting question. I, I hope we can get them back <laughs> in the Hangout. I'm not sure how how that would be confusing um, to annotate it in both ways. I'd have thought it would be potentially misleading not to annotate it in both ways. The, um, I guess the only thing I can think, the way I can think that that would be confusing would be if you annotated um, independently as a place from as a person without any indication that it was both. So if you were looking at one, aha, I just see never right. back. I'll Sorry you. guys, uh, tell me where did you lose the connection? When, where were we when, when we lost? You had just got to the end of the slide about with the quotation about chaos. Ah, with the quotation about chaos. Oh, sorry. I hope I hope you had a good time. <laughs> there are, there are, we have interesting. Sorry, sorry we, yeah. we have interesting questions for you at the end of the session. So we discussed yeah, okay. it. Okay, we uh, uh, we had a uh, uh, so we uh, let let me do this. So I will now repeat the summary uh, because I, I tried to, to make a summary of what we have learned. And then if there is a question for Florina or for anybody, you can ask, uh, ask us, okay? Yeah, but if you still have slides, uh, so we still have until 6 p.m. Yeah. And yeah, yeah, yeah. This is, this is this what I want to do now, okay? Okay. Okay, okay good. So uh, I uh, so we have been uh, speaking about the chaos, and now we will go to to the uh, to the summary and to con to conclusions. Just a moment. So uh, so uh, sorry for uh, sorry for this. As you know, uh, whenever we need to do something that fails, this is Murphy's Law in action. Uh, but I will try to summarize this again, and people here in the room have already heard this, but they will uh, repetitio est mater studiorum for them. What have we, we learned this semester? Uh, first of all, our uh, task was to learn how to use Recogito, how to use this for annotation. And people had the chance not only to do this, but they also had a chance to work together. They had 
a chance to see other people's annotation to discuss them uh, and to uh, improve their own. We also had a lot of opportunities uh, to uh, think about categories that we are using. We had to change them, we had to modify them because we found out that what we started with wasn't always completely appropriate, so the texts made us change our minds during annotation. Uh, for example, this is just one question, uh, did Greeks and Romans really believe their gods? Were the gods for them uh, real characters or fictional characters. This is something that we were not being able to solve, but it has been very clear to us that this question exists. Uh, what we've been doing is we have been trying to uh, compile an index, something that in the 20th century will be called index locorum or index personarum. But this is more than a simple reference tool. This is also uh, a tool that we can use for research. And it has become very clear to us because even the first step when we want to decide is this a name, is this a person, is this a place, this can require decisions from us. And even this step uh, is a challenge. So this is what we have been doing. This is a scholarship. This is how you do it in the humanities. Um, we also saw that our uh, situation was a bit more complicated because we have decided to annotate works of art. We have decided to annotate creative works, metamorphosis and the birds, where uh, people and places are all the time moving between the real space, so to say, and the fictional space. For Aristophanes, he does it mostly to achieve comical effects. Ovid wants to achieve something else, perhaps. Uh, but uh, we see this, this same oscillation, so to say, the same movement between the real and the fictional already on the level of the names of people and places. Um, what was important is how do we know, how do we see when something has moved between the real and the fictional? Of course, we know this from context. And this is why people have stressed today the importance of context for deciding whether something is a place or what kind of a place is it and so on. Uh, at the same time, uh, in a way, a word is alive only in its context. When we take it out of the context, we don't know anymore how did we decide that this is a person, that this, this is a real person. So some of the meaning is necessarily lost if we take the word out of the context. And this is how our index differs from the index locorum uh, of the early 20th century, because we are doing the indices without going away from the text. This is what Recogito makes possible. And now it is the time and this is my opportunity to thank the team, people who have spent the semester uh, here, not only listening to all of your presentations, but uh, doing their own research, doing their own work. This has been in the order of appearance, Petar, Sandro, Veronica, Mirna, Barbara, Matea, and Florina. And we have been doing this in Zagreb, in Croatia. So we have been reading Ovid and Aristophanes, not here, not in this place that you can see on the, uh, on the, uh, on the photo, but slightly to the south of it. Okay, well, thank you. So now, we are ready for your questions. Nevin, thank you very much and thank you all for the presentation. In the end, we lost a few minutes, so don't worry. And these things happen.
happen. So as I said before, we love technology, but sometimes technology fails. is what anyway. So it was a great session, really. Thank you. And I think we have uh, interesting uh, questions because uh, when we lost you, we started discussing a bit, given that you presented a very interesting and difficult text, I have to say. And uh, we have interesting notes and questions by Stelios and Gabby. So Stelios, if you want to, to repeat your uh, remark. Uh, yes, uh, well, with uh, ha hello everybody. Uh, I'm Stelios from uh, Freiburg now. Uh, uh, thank you very much for the presentation, all of you. Uh, with the summary of Nevin, it became clear, uh, more clear what I would like to ask. Uh, my question during the break was uh, about, especially about uh, the decision to annotate Terra as a place and as a name simultaneously. Uh, and uh, I was uh, thinking about this decision as possibly problematic. Uh, now, after your summary, Nevin, uh, I reformulate the question like this. Generally speaking, Terra can be both. In some texts, it is clearly one place. In other texts, it is clearly another thing, a person. And in some texts, it is not easy to decide if it is one or the other or both at the same time. So, uh, to put it like that, for me it would, it would be important to have both information. The information that the Terra in general can be both and the information that in this particular text or in this particular context, uh, Terra is one of them or we, don't, we cannot decide uh, which one of them. Do you find that reasonable? Um, so, does somebody want to comment on this? People? Oh. Florina, it was your team, yeah? Uh, yeah. Huh? Yeah? Barbara? No, I don't know. I, I mean, but uh, we, we have to look at context, especially in this text. I don't know. The, uh, no, no, Stelios, uh, Stelios agrees with you. Just I think that the question was, uh, there, are, uh, there are two things. We didn't go far from texts. Mm -hmm. We were thinking about the word in the text. And Stelios, if I understand correctly, you are also thinking about Terra as something that we would read, for example, in a dictionary, yes? Exactly. Or in a geographical, in, in Ptolemaeus, for example, in a geographical treatise, talking about Ge or Terra. Mm -hmm. so, so you are thinking, in a way, you are thinking about the next step. We have just finished annotating Ovid, and now you want to us to bring your, uh, our annotations together with your, for example. That's true, I, I am afraid. Yes, I'm thinking, <laughs> I'm afraid about the next step. You are right, Nevin. Yeah, well, no, I think this is great. I mean, this is what we have been, why we have been doing this. Uh, of course, the Pelagios has these great possibilities to export annotations, but then uh, the, uh, people, you will see that then the problem will start because Stelios will tell you, but why are you thinking that Terra is uh, that Terra is a, a person because I know that this is a place. I know from my text that this is a place. So what will we? What shall we do? What do you say about that? Um, well, I don't know. We should. Uh, I don't know. Um, <laughs> we should tell Stereos, yes, what is worth, what is good for your text is not, perhaps is not good for our text, but uh, Stereos is also thinking that we will have to somehow to think about some place, some, uh, some meta annotation, which will connect both his case and, uh, and our case. What do you, what do you think, Stereos? Uh, sorry, to put it like that, uh, the interesting thing for me would be to have these three different pieces of 
information. The first one is the contextual meaning of Terra. The second one is the abstract possibilities of meaning of Terra in all texts whatsoever. And the third piece is metadata about a specific text or a specific context that allows me to connect meaning of Terra with metadata about text or context and find out distributions according to specific parameters or, uh, and see their uh, patterns. And uh, for the matter of fact, the most interesting cases, of course, are the cases where we cannot decide if it is place or uh, goddess or person. And we have, of course, to take account also of these uh, cases. So this is, a, this is what I'm thinking as the next step of combining uh, information uh, extracted from specific contexts in order to combine text or data with each other. Um, yes, I, I agree with you. I think that simply being able to say that this is a simple case and you have seen this, um, who, who, who had this? I think, um, uh, uh, so we, we have shown today that some of the cases are very simple. So clearly some of the names represent people and the, these are real people. Some of the places are the real places and that's no problem. But some of the situations are more problematic and for us this is a start. We can say let's put everything that is simple on one on the one side and let's put the problematic things on the other side and now we can say how those two uh, two piles of names are different this this is what we would be doing but if i can add something so for example we have been discussing this uh, a lot also when working on the CTS architecture. Now, I don't want to discuss about technical details, but Nevin, you know the CTS architecture. Basically, uh, this model allows us to, to cite and to po point precisely to text and to words. So when uh, we, we annotate one word, so we have a CTS URI, an identifier for a specific word, in this case, a proper name, you can say, then we can uh, associate, connect to this uh, word, this identifier, different metadata, definitely, depending on the context. And then we can produce different, uh, how can I say, indices also, because of course the same proper name can have different roles in different contexts as a, a, a geographical name or as a personification. So this is something that makes sense. And in the end, the model is not so different from the traditional model of, especially of indices produced in the 19th century, where we have uh, disambiguated indices in our works, where at the end of the editions produced in the 19th century, because after that usually we have just uh, indices with both geographical names, personal names, and so on. But uh, in older editions, this is at least in my experience what I'm seeing now, we have specific indices where editors specify the role of a specific problem in a context. I don't know if it, this makes sense. Maybe I'm referring to this data model, which is the CTS site architecture, and we are thinking about that. So we start by producing identifiers for each word, and then we can uh, attach to them different metadata. Um, so, Monica, I, I agree with you. I think that uh, what you have seen today is a group of, pe of people preparing some material, but the real life of this material starts in a way when our annotations start talking to other people's annotations. Of course, they won't be talking themselves, but it will be again us doing the analysis, and we will be able to ask questions and this is why we have chosen two different texts, because now we can say, okay, are the places and the persons in Aristophanes different from the persons, not, not uh, you know, not which one persons and places, but 
How are those mentioning of names different in Aristophanes if we want to compare it uh, with Ovid? And this is not something that we would usually do, and perhaps this is a crazy idea, but uh, we can also compare texts which are more similar, we can compare texts from the similar periods, from the similar genres, and so on. And we can do this, for example, uh, if, if everybody involved in Sinoikesis did their own annotations, then we, could put, we, you know, we now have possibility to put this all into one database, and then to query, to question this database together. And this is what I've been thinking uh, about when I mentioned interpretation. And this is what you've been speaking about, if I understood you correctly. Yes, exactly. And I totally agree. I know this is not uh, a crazy idea, not at all. And again, so here I'm, I'm discussing both about uh, questions concerning the interpretation of text and also technical aspects because uh, uh, we have been working a lot also on producing data models and so on. But definitely, in the end, this is a problem of aligning different texts. In this case, we have Aristophanes and Ovid, and so we can align the text and see the differences. So, again, we can do that, aligning them, and then adding different interpretations. Uh, also, the disagreement among scholars, among annotators, because uh, uh, we know that <laughs> many times we have a disagreement. In fact, my questions before was, so you work together as a team on this text, but did you produce different parallel annotations separately and then you compare them or you work together on the text? Because there is this possibility also, this is something that we are trying with um, tree banking or also translation alignment. So to have different people annotating separately the text and then we can compare the text. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so you about your method. Uh, yeah, uh, would, would somebody want to explain how we work? Okay, yeah, I Barbara, Barbara, Barbara please. Just, want... just, just speak up. So. Okay. Uh, I was actually want, want to say this. Uh, when we first started this discussion. I think that a lot, a lot of uh, annotations here uh, depended on the rules we established while we were annotating. So uh, every, everyone got a part of text, uh, like uh, 100 uh, lines, yes. Uh, so, and we had to uh, annotate at home and then we would uh, get together and we would talk while, about problems uh, everyone had. Uh, and then we had to like make a deal what will be, I don't know. Uh, I, I found 10 Eric Halatan uh, to be a name, but uh, we, we, someone else said no, uh, it's not a name because it's not written in capital letters. So we, had to agree, okay, everything that is not written in capital letter won't be a name. And that is how we solved most of our problems. And I don't know, it was like agreement that we had what will be annotated in what way. So we didn't annotate uh, the same text. Uh, everybody, we didn't have eight annotation sets, but we, uh, our hypothesis was that everybody will have similar problems. And it turned out to be true because everybody who had to annotate Ovid had to think about gods and had to think about fictional places. And everybody who had to annotate Aristophanes had to think about uh, whether all those curses and all those, uh, all those invoking Apollo and Heracles, whether they are the actual persons or just something in the language. So we got together and compared our notes. This, this, was, uh, this was our way of working in this seminar. Okay, excellent. Thank you. Okay, and then you mentioned Barbara is your name. I apologize if uh, you're Barbara. Okay, good. Thank you for mentioning also the problem of capital letters because, of course, in modern editions of classical sources, we have this problem. We can be also a problem from a computational point of view if we start using these criteria. So let's select uh, uh, capitalized words. But uh, 
<laughs> this can be a problem, of course. This is an editorial convention. So yes, so thank you, this is. But now, I don't know if there are other questions. Gabby was saying something because during the break, Elias and Gabby were uh, talking. I don't know, Gabby, if you want to add something because then we interrupted you. No, I think I think Stelios covered what um, what I was what I was saying in his in his re re summary of his um, of his question. Um, I think the only thing I would have added to that um, discussion, um, going back uh, briefly, is the um, the importance. Of, there's two things that are equally important um, if you're attempting to disambiguate a word like terra or a word like scamandros say in, in, in Homer, which is you know a river but also also a god, um, is you um, when you when you want to uh, disambiguate these you say, okay, terra is a place, here is how you, where you find that in a gazetteer, here is where you find that on the earth's surface. Um, on the other hand here terra is a person, here is where you find her in a list of gods. Um, that Two things are both important. One, that you link the two together. So you make it clear that Terra is both. Um, not only potentially both, but in this particular context is both. Um, but it should, it's also important that when I'm looking at a list of places and I find, and I find references to Terra, which are you know, unambiguously you know, mundane geographical references, that I also find this ambiguous reference in there at the same time. So, we need to make the ambiguity clear, but we need not to lose the the individual references as well, um, because you know I might just be looking for references to places, um, um, and I want I want to find this ambiguous one as well. And how we do that, I'm not sure, because you have a gazetteer and you have a prosopography that that you don't normally link them. You don't normally say this place and this person are are the same when in 99% of cases they're not. So. Yeah, this this is this is why I think what uh, Veronica, Veronica has shown how you can have two annotations of the same textual passage. One is saying that this is a person, and one is saying that this is a place. This is very important, and I can only say that uh, people you you have to see that Pelagios is making this possible because we can then think. And let's go back to what Monica has said. If we have a precise mechanism to refer to a place in the text, so we say um, we have two annotations that are saying different things, but they are pointing to the same place in the text. So we can uh, point, we can put our finger on ambiguity in the text. And for us as literary scholars, this is great, and we are we are satisfied with this. Of course, you want also to know uh, which is which as a scholar of antiquity, and this is your part. This is the second part, having Terra as a deity and having Terra as a place in a way. Uh, but we are also interested in this uh, complicated. So, so what I think you're saying, and I like, and I like this a lot. If this is what you're saying, is that the the gazetteer that you use to disambiguate your reference is in fact built from all the references that you use that you use to point to it. Well, right. every instance yeah, it. We could do this, yes. yeah. and so we could accept this gazetteer, and that, that, there you have the disambiguation right there. Yeah, I mean, this this is what you suggested. We can. We can make a, a cross-reference, we can see which uh, word appears in both lists. And then we know that something special is happening with this word. And of course, we, are, we will be thinking about those uh, simple words which don't give rise to anything, any ambiguity like this. We, we, we can ask ourselves, okay, why not? Why is this, uh, so to say, a, a provocative word? And this one isn't. Okay. Great. Okay, excellent. So, well, and definitely, Nevin, I agree with you. As humanists, we love ambiguities and disagreements. <laughs> so, I know. <laughs> We're difficult people. But then, there is a, a question in the chat by Anise. I don't know, Nevin, if you can read the chat in the Google Hangout. 
Oh no, can you can you tell yes. me? Oh, I, try so. Never. I don't master this skill. <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, ah, okay, okay. Anise said that it was already answered. Yes, it was about these things concerning, yes, the context uh, and annotations. And um, yeah, so I don't know if there are other questions. It's 6.15. You can have one minute more. Anyway, it was very, very interesting. So thank you all first for working as a group. This is really what we want to have and uh, especially for Sonoic Isis. So Neve, thank you. And it's uh, a pleasure to see a group of people, students, uh, and uh, well, your professor working together and experimenting with these tools. And definitely, as we always say, we want to annotate, we need to work on data because when we try, when we start working on this data, we get in trouble, of course. But this is the interesting part. And this is important for, because we need data, we need the training data, and also in order to improve it, to implement our tools, we need to experiment with them. And this was really a clear uh, example. And uh, well, then, uh, um, yeah, other things. So it was really, it was great, very, very dense. So thank you all. So you have, so everything, everything worked in the end. So don't worry, because in the end, we really lost <laughs> very few <laughs> minutes. And we have your uh, class outline in GitHub. So for other people who are following us, we have the uh, class outline. And um, yes, we, we also already have your slides. So it's, uh, it's perfect. And so at this point, our time is over. Uh, we will meet again next week. We have another session about lexicography and we have Stelios Kronopoulos from Freiburg who is going to present about this topic. And so thank you all in Zagreb. Thank you for your contribution. I can add one thing that you are very lucky because Mervin is an excellent scholar, an excellent digital philologist, so really, and we can see the results. So really, thank you, and enjoy the end of the semester, and enjoy your summer. Here in Germany, we still have one month. <laughs> yeah, I know you still have to work, this is why we are in the South. So yes. thanks everybody, and thank you, thank you to all the other presenters. We have really learned much this semester, and this is somehow that uh, listening to all of you people, this is something that gave us courage to, uh, to speak in English to the international audience. And of course, we had, we had some technical difficulties, but I hope everything will, uh, was solved in the end. No problem. Thank, no. thank no. you very much. Okay, thank you. See you. Goodbye and good night. Okay. Bye. 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 Bye.